The following program is made possible by generous gifts from partners like you. Discipling the Nations is a ministry with a vision designed to strengthen and develop the life and faith of the believer worldwide. When I was uh, single, I was in my 30s and my house was broken into and I lived in a flat on 55th and North Avenue, a house right on the alley and someone broke into my home and my brother had given me, um, he lived in Japan at the time and he had sent me a Nakamichi. And if you know anything about systems, the Nakamichi, and he sent me the top of the line Nakamichi stereo system. And I had that Nakamichi in my house and the Nintendo had just come out and I bought it for Quentin and they, they, Quentin got hit hard. Quentin got hit the hardest with this robbery. And so they went through the house and they took all of our electronics. And what, you know, when you get, when somebody takes something from you, the way that you're left feeling you can't even describe it when somebody there's it's like when somebody first dies fear will creep up on you and you're like what is this but you're from now on you're thinking about who's coming and going in your house you're coming around the corner you're looking you're you know you're checking things out well in that moment i realized i'm going to have to deal with this fear I'm going to have to deal with this or I'll never go back into my apartment. And so the Lord had given me Psalms 144 verses 14 through 15. And this is what the second part of that scripture says. It says, may no one break in and may no one be dragged out. May there be no cries of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people who have these blessings. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. I took those verses of scripture and applied them to my life. Nobody else is going to break in and nothing else is going to be dragged out of my house. Amen. Even today, this word is tailor made for any of you who may have experienced a robbery or a theft. God was and still is greater and more powerful than any thief or robber who may have violated our homes or stolen our properties. And the church said, Amen. Mm -hmm. God will deal with them on his basis and on his terms. You know, you, the first thing you want to do, the knee jerk response is you're looking for him. You want to go get a gun. You want to all of that. That's the knee jerk response, but they long gone. Got your stuff and gone. And so what you have to do is you have to let God deal with the thief on his own terms. Yeah. So we don't have to worry about it. God will always be our protection and our refuge. I was flying from um, Arizona a few days ago and we hit some pockets of air. It the turbulence was intense on my plane. Now they were on one plane and I, they, she was on another plane, but I was on the plane by myself. And the turbulence hit that aircraft and immediately I pulled out my Bible and I went right to Psalms 91. Because remember last week I told you, you can't pull out the blood. <laughs> no, there's no scripture that tells us to pull out the blood for protection. It tells us that the blood redeems us. Amen. But there is no place that it's written that the blood will protect us. So we've been pleading the blood and all of that, and we don't have any scriptural basis for it. But we do have Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide, the Amplified Bible says, stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. And so I went to confessing Psalms 91. And I confessed Psalms 91 until that plane leveled out. And when the plane leveled out, I said, Lord, I thank you and went back to doing what I was doing. So what am I doing? I'm using and applying the word of God in my circumstance. Amen. Amen. Can you relate to my experience? Amen. How would you describe your relationship with God's word right now? How would you describe your relationship with the word of God? 
Do you feel a twinge of guilt when the topic comes up because you feel like you should read it more often? Or do you feel a sense of satisfaction because you got yours in this morning? I want to challenge you tonight. Don't think about the last time you read the Bible, but think about what you read and what stuck with you when you read it. Amen. We have to be able to go to God's word and something sticks, something stays, something stays, something sticks, something penetrates our life and penetrates our heart so that God can change us and so that God can do what he desires to do through your life in the earth. Amen. God wants us to have an appreciation for how his word applies to our everyday life. It's time for us to rethink our views of the Bible. Say amen. amen. We don't want to take the word of God for granted or approach reading the word of God like it's a chore. It's not a chore. I love what Creflo Dollar says. It's not something that I have to do. It's something that I get to do. Amen. Amen. Imagine what it would be like if you prepared a loving meal for your family, everything they loved and wanted, and instead of being excited, they walked in and said, my favorite dish again? <laughs> Do we have to have this, my favorite food again? Do we have to have what I need again? Lord have mercy. That would be pretty insulting. I wonder if God feels that way when we, we regard his word in a way that lacks passion. The word of God is very necessary for our faith as Christians. If you try to follow Jesus without the word of God, you're not going to get very far because it's impossible to follow or know Jesus independent of the word. And we know what John 1 and 1 says. In the beginning was the word. The word was God and the word was with God. So the word and Jesus are synonymous. They're the same. Amen? Amen. We have to understand that the Bible is much more than an ancient manual full of historical stories and do's and don'ts. It's a divine wind machine that inflates our sails with God's very breath. Yes. I'm going to say that again. Amen. The Bible is not an ancient manual full of historical stories and do's and don'ts. It's a divine wind machine that inflates our sails with God's very breath. The Bible gives us direction and purpose. It propels us forward. Jesus said in John, the sixth chapter, verse number 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh profits or counts for nothing. The words I have spoken unto you are spirit. And that word spirit is breath. Yes. They are spirit and they are life. Yes. Zoe. You know, in the original Greek language, you know, which is what the New Testament was written from, the Old Testament was written from the Hebrew. But in the original language in the New Testament, the word spirit, it means Remember, God breathed, God, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath, the spirit of life. And man became a living soul. Jesus is telling us that his words, the message that he came to deliver to us are not words. Basically, he's saying, these words I've spoken to you are my breath, the blast of wind to give you life. Or to put it another way, my words are fresh air for you. We were staying in a hotel, Pastor Dana and I, and we walked into this hotel. And, you know, when you the minute you walk in, you can smell cigarette smoke from the time you walk in. This is a smoke-free hotel with a casino attached to it. And you, we couldn't even walk in, and the smoke was so bad. And the last night that we were there, I literally had to cover my head. Now, I'm in my room on the sixth floor, and the smoking's in the casino that looks like and it's in another building. 
but the smoke was so bad, I couldn't, I couldn't hardly breathe. And I'm trying to sleep with my head covered. What did I need? I needed some fresh air. Fresh air. You know what it's like when you can't breathe, when it's stuffy, you get in a room where there's been mold or mildew. You want you want fresh air. That's what the word of God is to our lives. It's fresh air. Glory to God. Whether we've experienced or not, the entire Bible has ultimate strength. It has the power to bring about its own fulfillment. Did you hear what I just said? The word of God doesn't need any help from anybody to fulfill it. It has inerrant power. It has the ability to fulfill itself. Thank you, Lord. It's active and dynamic and meets you where you are if you let it sink into your heart and into your mind. The word of God is like a compass that's always at true north. It can dramatically alter your life course and show you who God is and who you are. And we need to know who we are. The word of God can transform the way you live and help you discern what's God's and what's not God's. In fact, the word of God itself tells us what it can do. Let's go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm reading this out of the new Uh, the uh, NIV translation. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number 12. It says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's why you got to stay in it. So you want to know what's in your own heart? A lot of times when we're dealing with one another, we can't see what's in our own heart. You know, we were talking, I was talking to someone the other day and I said, you know, when situations happen, you judge the situation, you judge the situation based on what happened. But somebody else will judge the situation based on their intentions. One is judging on the outcome. It's the same situation, but one is judging on the outcome, but the other one is judging on their intentions. Well, my heart was right. See, only the word of God can tell us whether or not our heart is right. That's why we have to stay in it. Because you can think in your mind that you're right. But the word will tell you whether or not it's, does it line up with the word? How you're feeling? Is it consistent with what God is saying? And if how you think, how you feel, if any of those things, if they don't line up with the word of God, I'm sorry. You're wrong. Say, oh me. Oh me. Yeah, especially for those of us that are married. Okay, I'm, that's not my message. <laughs> you got really quiet. <laughs> but the word of God judges our thoughts and it judges the attitudes of our heart. God's word is alive. And when it's allowed to, it will cut through anything you face. God doesn't just want you to read his word. He wants his word to read you. He said it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your heart. He doesn't want you just reading the word. He wants the word to get so ingrained in you that the word can read you. Because we can't, I don't know why we're made this way. And maybe it's because we're still dealing with the sin nature, but we can't see ourselves. That's why the Bible tells you, you get that, you get that tree stump out of your eye and stop trying to get that little moat that's in my eye out of my eye. You can't see the tree stump in your own eye. And I don't know why that is. We don't know why we can't see us, but the word of God will help you see you. When we do the word of God, the word will align our emotions and our mind with God as we make day-to-day decisions. 
There's nothing too difficult, nothing too painful, nothing too embarrassing, nothing too human, nothing too earthly for the word of God to address. I don't want to bother God with that. Bother the word of God with it. It doesn't matter what it is, the word of God. And it may, it may not say, pack your bags and move to Sarasota, Florida. But the wisdom that you need is in the word. And you'll just know what it is that you're to do. The people in the word of God should inspire you. They can coach you. They can challenge you. They can instruct you. And sometimes they will amaze you if you allow them. Because the people in the word of God, what they did is they got a word from God. And isn't it something that they were able to do some of the things that they were able to do without a text? They didn't have the word of God written. They didn't have 66 books broken down into chapter and verse. All they had was the voice. And they banked their entire lives on what the voice had to say. And we struggle just to believe one of the books. He's helping us. He's helping us. So how do we get there? How do we get to this place? How can we reach the place where reading the word of God engages us and brings us joy and helps us to interact with God? Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, us interacting with God. You know, I was thinking about it. We were having some conversations and we were talking about the purpose of worship. The purpose of worship is not just to get you a really good feeling. The purpose of worship is to get you to engage with God. And so everything that we're doing, it's all to get all of us in his face. Amen. It's to get us to engage and interact with God. So how do we get there? It's like dough that needs an ingredient to rise. The word of God requires our faith in order to be activated in our lives. And I know that this is elementary for you, but stay with me because I feel like we, we need to go back and do our first works over again. Your faith serves as the catalyst that enables you to take the necessary steps of obedience as you follow God and listen to his word. Your faith, say my faith. Now think about this. Why did the children of Israel have to wander around the desert for 40 years instead of just walking right into the land of promise? Why did they walk 40 years? 40 years. An 11 day journey took them 40 years. It was only supposed to take them 11 days. 40 years. Why? Let's go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse number two, it says, for we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard, the message they heard, the word of God they heard was of no value to them because those who heard the message, the word of God did not combine it with faith. The children of Israel heard God's words, but they didn't trust him to fulfill what he promised. They heard it. But they didn't trust God to fulfill what he promised. Reading the word of God out of a sense of duty is like trying to make dynamite without nitroglycerin. You can't do it. It's not going to ignite when we are deficit, or I'm sorry, when we are deficient in our faith, or we fail to bring it to our encounter with the word of God, then we will view the word of God as a flat, lifeless thing and end up calling the word of God something boring, stale, mundane. But the word of God has the power, the ability in it to bring itself to pass. You can turn and transform into anything you need. You plant a seed of the word of God, it can become anything can you transform into anything you need? The word of God is so powerful. It's in seed form. And when that seed is planted, depending, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Because I can need one thing and you can need something else. And we both can plant our seeds and both get our need met. 
That's the power of the word of God. It's not something boring. It's not something dull. It's not something dead. What's been your experience? Maybe you've read the word of God and you didn't place any value on it because you just didn't get it. Or you came to church and you listened to Pastor Skip or you listened to me or you listened to somebody else and it was like another, for, it was like a, another culture, another foreign language because you just didn't seem to get much out of it or the word of God didn't seem to be relevant to you. But according to Hebrews 4, when faith is absent when you read God's word, the truth is housed in the word of God will not take root in your heart. See, right now they're just black, they're just black words. But there's power under every crossed T and every dotted I. Amen. So we've got to stay with it. You don't have to conjure up faith on your own. You know, that's one of the most frustrating things. You know, people trying to, I'm trying to get more faith. You don't have to get more faith. The Bible says that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. We don't have to work to get more faith. When the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. You don't have to ask the Lord to increase your faith. He said God has given to every man the measure. Now what you do with your faith is up to you. You have to develop your faith. Amen. 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 So we're not conjuring up our faith on our own. No. Active Bible faith is an automatic response. Faith just shows up. And I've done this illustration before. When you're getting in the word of God, you're studying the word. And I'm not talking about a drive by meal. I'm talking about a come in, sit down, five star waiter with the napkin on is waiting for you. That's the kind of meal that I'm talking about. When you hear the word of God, it's like a helicopter that comes and, and just hangs over your head. And it's just going. It's just over your head. It's just, you know, I believe that. I receive that. What happens? The truth of that comes into your heart. Your faith is activated. Faith just shows up when the word of God is preached, ministered, released, spoken. Amen. Faith is the knee jerk response of the living word of God. You know, have you ever had a problem or you were trying to, to figure something out and you were trying to figure this thing out for a long time and for a long time you just couldn't see it. And then one day you were either praying or, or walking down the street or laying down or just doing something regular and you had an aha moment. That's it. I see it. That's what God is looking for when you get in his word. He's looking for the aha. He's looking, it's called revelation. And remember what he told Peter. It's on this rock, Peter, that I'm going to build the church. The rock of revelation. The rock of, un, the, uh, the rock of aha is what I'm going to build my church on. And he said, the gates of hell won't be able to prevail against this. Why? Because it's a living, breathing. It's the word of God. Amen. The aha is the moment that you connect the dots and you realize what the problem is and what you need to do about it. Every time a passage from the word of God stands up, as I call it, and leaves you thinking, now I get it, now I understand, that's when your faith is activated. It is not when you're just reading that your faith is activated. It's when you get the aha that your faith just activated. Does that make sense? I've been reading it. And I, it just didn't, it hasn't happened. It's because you didn't stay in there and wait for the aha. You know, the Greek language is used for the original manuscripts. So I said that already. But there are two Greek terms for the word word. 
the word word. There's two Greek terms for the word word. One's used to describe the kind of insight and illumination we just talked about, the aha, the epiphany. The moment all the lights come on, it's called the rhema, R-H-E-M-A. And I know this is elementary for some of you, but it's the aha, the rhema. The other Greek word is the logos, and it, logos or logos, people say it differently. It refers to the literal words on the page as you're reading them when you're looking at your Bible. So we've got two things that we're dealing with when we open up our Bibles. We start out on the Logos level. But if we stay in it, we stay with it until the aha comes, we step over into Rhema. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for the Rhema of his word to be in operation in your life. Because when the Rhema comes into manifestation, your faith automatically shows up. Rhema. It's more than just the words themselves. It's also more than just the voice of God because some people say, well, the Logos is what's written. The Rhema is what's spoken. No, it's more than just that. The Rhema is the process of understanding the word of God. It's having eyes to see, ears to hear. That's what Jesus said. Th those in the church, let you, you need to have eyes to see, Ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. He's saying, you need revelation. Yes. Glory to God. Having eyes to see and ears to hear, it's almost like reading between the lines so that you get a sense of the real message and its relevance and application for your life. So a lot of us get stuck focusing on the logos, the written word. And we don't press into a deeper encounter with the word, the rhema, the revealed word. Remember that you're going to need faith if God's word is going to come alive to you. And in order to have your faith activated, you need to experience the revelation or the rhema. Pastor Skip says it's the word behind the word. You got to experience the word behind the word. And if you've ever experienced it before, it's a beautiful thing. When Jesus himself takes on flesh, he steps out of the pages of his word. Thank you, Lord. You know, I was thinking about Mary and Gabriel in the book of Luke and that encounter that she had with the angel. And he said, uh, you know, I've come to tell you that you're going to have a baby. And um, she said to him, she said, uh, how, how's that going to happen? <laughs> Saying, I don't, I've never known a man. I'm a virgin. What was that? That was the logos, the logos. That was what was written. How is this going to happen? What did the angel say to her? The spirit of God is going to overshadow you. And you're going to conceive a child. For with God, nothing is impossible. Aha. I, I see. See, that's what Rhema is. Rhema, I see, I see it. He said, the spirit of God is going to overshadow you. For with God, nothing's impossible. And let me tell you, let me tell you something about that. Nothing is impossible. Oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Don't want to do that. She was at the Logos level. And she was saying, I, you have to take me deeper. The angel at that time represented the word of God. He was the one carrying God's word. And she was saying, I see on the surface. But how is that going to happen? Take me, take me deeper. He said, the spirit of God, there we go. The spirit of God. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, Peter, but my father, the spirit, my father revealed this to you. This is, this has come to you by revelation. So here's the revelation, Mary, the spirit of God is going to overshadow you and you're going to conceive a child. What did she say? Be it unto me according to your word. 
at the Logos level, she was saying, how is this going to happen? But at the Rhema level, she was saying, be it unto me according to what you have spoken. Glory to God. It's the revelation moment. Mary said, I get it. I see what you're saying. And as a result of her staying with the one who brought the word, she stayed with the word. She didn't walk away when he said, you're going to have a child. She didn't get up and walk off. Had she gotten up and walked off, the revelation, she would have never had the immaculate conception. The word of God, the embryo that was in Mary's womb was the word of God. And if Mary had gotten up and walked away when the Logos, at the Logos level, she would have never, ever conceived the Christ child. But she went deeper. She said, tell me, she's pulling on the word. She's placing a demand on the word. She's saying, tell me more. Take me deeper. That's revelation. It's more than just a voice. It's understanding the word behind the word. She didn't walk away at the Logos level. She stared, stayed there waiting for deeper insight because she persisted, because she persisted, because she stayed. Revelation came to her and produced faith in her heart. When, when, when he said, the spirit of God is going to overshadow you, for with God, nothing's impossible, she conceived. What happened? Her faith, faith just said, here you go, Mary. She didn't have to fight for her faith to believe. Faith just linked arms with the word of God and brought it to pass. Does that make sense to you? This is how we receive everything we need to receive from God. It's by the rhema. It's by revelation of what God said and faith being activated in our life and then us responding to it. Be it unto me according to your word. It's responding to what God has said. Oh, I want y'all to get this. Amen. The revelation was this. The spirit of God is going to overshadow you and nothing is impossible with God. Something in my belly just leaped. The spirit of God is going to overshadow you and nothing is that's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And this is how it's going to happen. What he said to her hit her in the gut. Nothing is impossible with God. She could see it. This was not Christian jargon. This was real to her. Nothing is impossible with God, which meant something to her in the Greek. Now listen to this. In the Greek, the expression for nothing is actually two words. In the Greek, the expression for nothing is actually two words, and they are no word. In other words, it literally read like this. No word is impossible to be fulfilled with God. What he was saying to her was, Mary, if what I'm saying ever becomes a revelation to you, if it becomes rhema, then nothing is impossible. And that is the point of faith. When you step into the realm of revelation, your faith is activated, and that is the place that you can ask God for anything you want, and he'll do it. The problem is, is that we don't work to revelation. We fall asleep at Logos. The angel said, nothing is impossible. No word that God speak. Remember that God can, the word of God has the power to fulfill itself. He said, no word that God speaks when it becomes a revelation to you will lack the power for its own fulfillment. There's nothing in the Bible that says, oh, there, there's nothing in the Bible that becomes an aha or, or an oh, I get it moment that will ever lack the power to actually happen in your life. Rhema is essential. It's powerful. And it's what's necessary to take you from the ordinary to the extraordinary. By acting on the revealed word of God, the rhema, you can change your life, your family, city, the nations, the world. 
Say Rhema. Rhema. Throughout the Old and the New Testament, we're told numerous times in numerous ways to meditate on God's word. This is how we do it. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, and one of the meanings for the word meditate is rumination. Say rumination. rumination. The word rumination, this is the same word that's described for a cow chewing or rechewing and further breaking down to plant matter for digestion, the cud. The cud is the food a cow ingests, chews, swallows, regurgitates, and then chews some more before swallowing it again. According to animal scientists, cows spend about eight hours a day chewing their cud. Say eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hours a day chewing their cud, which works out to about 30,000 chews. <laughs> Because of the way that their digestive system is configured, it's critical that cows keep chewing over and over again to moisten, oh, I love it, to moisten their food, to break it down into smaller pieces. This is how we meditate on the word of God. Staying with it, staying with it, chewing the cud, bringing it up, regurgitating it, going back over it again, chewing it up some more, giving it some more moisture, keeping it going, regurgitating it, keeping it going. What are you doing? You're getting it. You're getting it down to plant size so that you can digest it easily. You know, we're so bombarded with information every day. Emails, Facebook, magazines, Twitter, reports, articles, letters, notes, magazines, and books. It's gotten to the point that most of us don't even read anymore. We just skim. It's too much. I, I opened up my email. About, you know, we were gone. I opened up my email. I had 1,857 emails. I don't know when they all came in. 1,000? That's too many. It's too many. We don't have that kind of time. And what the Lord is saying to us, that's designed to steal your time. It's designed, that's what it is. Satan is, the Bible says Satan is a strategist. He's clever. He knows what he's doing in our lives. But the Bible says that we're not ignorant of his wicked devices, the schemes and the strategies of the devil. You can sit down on Facebook. You're going to put, I have sat down to, to reach out to somebody. And by the time I got done reading everybody's posts, I get up and forgot why I even sat down. It's a distraction. I need to be somewhere ruminating. <laughs> Chewing the cud. Amen. Rarely do we read something from the word of God and think about it and ponder it and think about it some more and then go back and read it again and again and again. That's what God is talking about. This is what he's talking about in Joshua, the first chapter, verse number eight. He said, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. He said, don't let it get out of your mouth. He said, meditate. Those two words, don't let it get out of, chew it. Don't let it get out of your mouth. He said, chew it, swallow it, regurgitate it, and chew it some more. Let's go there, Joshua 1 and 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, from your what? Mouth. This book of the law shall not depart from your what? Mouth. You got everything else in your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart from your what? Mouth. See, people who, who, people who got the word in their mouth don't have time to put Sally in their mouth. Amen. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you are to, Medicine. which means to ruminate, ruminate. <laughs> which means to chew it. Yes. Over and over and over again. Look at what he said will happen when you do that. What are you doing when you're chewing something over and over? You ever get a good piece of barbecue steak that's been seasoned well? Or something off the grill that's been seasoned really well? But think about it. What are you doing? You're getting all of the flavor. All the juices. You're getting, you, get, you want to taste it all. 
You're getting everything that's in there out of there. That's why you keep chewing it. And he said that we're supposed to do this how often? Yeah. Lord Jesus. See, if you got the word in your mouth and you're meditating and you're chewing on the word day and night, you don't have time for foolishness. We don't have time for anything else. What are you doing? I'm meditating on the word day and night. He said, then you're going to make your way prosperous and then you are going to have. No, he didn't say success. He said, you'll make your way prosperous and you will have Good success, not just success, darling. Good success. Is that an adjective? That's an adjective. He said, you go, your success is not, you're not just going to have success. It's going to be good. Why? Because you were chewing. You were ruminating. You were somewhere ruminating. Thank you, Lord. You got to chew the cud. If we want what comes after the then, then you'll make then. If we want what comes after, which after the word then, which is prosperity and success, then we have to do what comes before the then, which is chew the cud, meditate. If you want the word of God to be a revelation to you, if you want it to be a rhema so that your faith can activate and bring what you desire to fruition, you're going to have to meditate on the word of God. Now, I'm going to close with this because I'm going to be a good girl. In order to make the scriptures come alive, in order to experience the breath of life, the wind that comes from reading God's word, for the word to remain dynamic in all areas of your life, you're going to have to get in it and you're going to have to chew it over and over again. The word can never become stale to you. If the word is stale, if the word is stale, you know, I was thinking about this. The Bible says that the people... You know, the people who studied the word or heard the word of God, the children of Israel, when they heard the word, the Bible says that they didn't mix it with faith. They heard those people speaking the word to them, but they didn't mix it with faith. You know why? Because they were looking at the person. And they devalued the word that was in them. They couldn't receive from God because... They were too busy looking at the vessel, the flaws in the vessel. And they went as far as saying, he ain't the only one God speaks to. Remember? And what happened? The earth opened up and just swallowed them. And then when his brother and sister got out there saying, you're not the only one God speaks to. Leprosy. What happened? They devalued the word in the one that God ordained to bring it. What if Mary had looked at that angel and said, loose here, Satan? What if she had rejected? No, really. What if she had rejected that angel? You wouldn't be sitting in this room today. Her one act of obedience to the word of God saved your life. Her one act of obedience saved my life. Thousands of years later, and I'm still reaping the benefits of Mary's, be it unto me according to your word. That's the power of the word of God. It never dies. It never dies. The life in the word of God will transcend your life. And your children's children's children will be blessed because of the word of God in you. Discipling the Nations is a ministry with a vision designed to strengthen and develop the life and faith of the believer worldwide.